Welcome Mechie 102 students. This is a pre-studio video for the statics investigation. I'm going to walk you through the basic elements of the, the analysis we'll do this week in Excel. What you're seeing here is a template that's provided on my courses for this analysis, for this investigation. You can download it from there um, and you should definitely read. There's at least two documents on the my courses site related to this, one of which describes the basic experiment and the other which describes the mathematics behind it, specifically why we're doing these force ratios and cosines ratios and so forth. So read those first, then come back here and we'll talk about uh, the analysis that we're doing. So. I'll also show you a few other things about this, uh, in particular how to do the symbols theta one, theta two, and if I can move to the other worksheet as well that says data and y analysis, there's also these uh, quantities beta one and beta two and that sort of stuff. So I'll show you all those features, how they were done. Uh, even though they're already done in the headers on this template file, uh, you'll need to create them at least for the, for the access labels on the graphs you're going to create. So I'll show you that. Uh, as we get into it and some other features about this too just in the general course of using Excel. Let me point out here when you first come into this spreadsheet what you're seeing on the tab that should come up the worksheet that should come up it says data and x analysis labeled at the bottom left. These are the data that were collected that are going to be provided to you so they're for the running the experiment changing the angles of the different strings measuring the forces for four different applied masses 240 roughly 240 grams 230 grams, 220, and 200 grams. So it mimics the notion if you were conducting this experiment uh, with a team of four people, you would generally have uh, four sets of data like this. Each one has 11 data points, coincidentally, just what it is came out. Uh, let me show you before we get into anything here about how to create these headers, because again, they've all been done already. You'll notice there's a combination of things. First of all, I'll point out as, as always, I've got units in square brackets, a critically important thing. Um, lots of subscripts and things like that. So let me show you in the course of, I'm going to select this cell E3 that has a header cosine theta 2 over cosine theta 1, how I created that. If you follow along with that process, you'll see how to do these sorts of things, the symbols, uh, i.e. The, the Greek letters as well as the subscripts. I'm going to, to just create so that I can start from fresh here a new sheet in this workbook. You don't need to do this in general. Uh, but I want you to see starting fresh with no formatting of any kind, kind of how to get to something that looked like that. So let's just say I start typing cosine, C-O-S, open parentheses. Now I want that symbol, that Greek letter theta. Number of ways I guess you could do it, right? but the, the way I'll show you is we want to insert what's called a symbol. That's the vernacular for the Greek letters. So we'll go to the insert menu. Should be over toward the right, uh, a link for symbols. So if you just click on that and say symbol, It'll bring up a browser here of the different symbols that are available. Now, actually, you may start out at the very top if this is the kind of the first time you're using this uh, of the window. I'm not sure what things you might have to set. I use the default font of Calibri, so you might select that. Um, and then just starting at the top is this basic Latin. You may have to scroll down a bit. There's a lot of different symbols that are in here. Other ones that I do frequently use, like plus minus, there's the different fractions, there's all these Cyrillic characters and so forth. You may need to scroll down a ways to get to the Greek letters. Um, I think they're actually past all of these. Yeah, so here you can see the capital versions of all of them and then the lowercase versions. And then what also pops up is these that I recently used ones. I use these frequently, so they'll populate in that list below there. Let me, hit, let me cancel this just for a second because I want to recommend something. If you go back to that item there, the uh, the menu item at the top for insert symbols, right click and then, uh, sorry, click and then float over symbol and right click and say add to quick access toolbar. This is grayed out for me because I've already done it. What it will do is once you've done that, it will place up towards the top left that same symbol that as it turns out the omega, the capital omega symbol, um, a shortcut to that. So now you can just press and get the same thing. So we use these a lot, the, the insert symbols a lot in this class. I think in general you will in your engineering classes. Um, so I would recommend you do that. Once you've done it, find the theta or whatever symbol you want here. I, I'll get it from the recently used list. Hit insert and then close. So there it is. Let me zoom in on this a bit actually. Okay. So I'll put two because I want a subscript two. close parentheses slash cosine of 
same thing. You can copy and paste here if you like. I'll just do it again just to kind of reinforce the concept. Insert, close, theta 1, close parentheses. And now that for some reason did something a little wonky with the, with the font, that's okay. I'll make this back down to 12 and turn off the bold. Oh, it was off. Not sure why it did that. But in any event, there's our label thus far. Now that still doesn't look like what was in the other sheet. Um, to come back in here, I can double click on this. And notice, by the way, there wasn't an equal sign in front of this, so it doesn't treat it as a formula. It's just text. If you select the two, you can go then back to on the home menu item. There's a, a sub menu called font. If you click the little arrow to expand that, we'll have a pop up and we'll select subscript. It might show that. Maybe no, I guess not. Not until I hit OK. That made a subscript, and I can do the same thing for um, subscript one. And there we go. Now, notice when there's nothing else around this, if you have a cell content that's that's too big for the cell, it's happy to spill over into the next one. But if I were to type something over here, like F1, let's say, now that's cut off. And I really want to keep the, uh, one thing you could also do, you could come up here, then a double click. So if you float your cursor up to this, the separator between the columns, double click, and it will automatically expand to fit that. That's not bad. But what I don't like about that is that if I then have numbers under here, um, whatever they are, so forth. They're not very wide. Sometimes I end up with these kind of large, uh, wide columns with lots of white space. And if I've got lots of columns there, it makes this kind of unwieldy, the size of the spreadsheet. And maybe I want to fit things in a little bit more so it'll be easier to see. So perhaps I'd like this to be more like this width. How can I do that? Well, one thing you can do when you select the cell that's, that's kind of spilling over, if you go to, again, back to the home menu, there's one here. Um, under the alignment sub menu called wrap text click on that and it will wrap it around to fit so it'll expand the height of the row in order to fit in that width so that's getting closer but now the issue is uh, the cosine is kind of split which is sort of goofy so you could then come back up and tweak the width until it fits right I actually don't like that too much because maybe I want to independently control the width and have that fit me on, maybe on two lines. So another thing you can do, double click, I'll come back in here to edit this. What I want is a way to, to say to do a carriage return uh, and, and force it to be two lines at the split at the location where my cursor is right here. Now obviously if you just hit enter, it will uh, treat that as moving to the cell, moving out of the cell. So we have to have another shortcut, another way of doing that. It turns out if you hold down the alt key on your keyboard and hit enter, it will force that down into a new line. I don't know what the keystroke is on a Mac, um, but I'm sure if you're so inclined, you can find that easily enough. So that's the idea here. Now note that no matter how wide I make this column, it will keep those two, two rows and it does have that wrap feature. And then if I select the whole, whole cell, go back up to alignment here and say center in terms of the horizontal alignment, that is more or less the, the uh, heading, if I come back here to the first worksheet, there you can see that's how I did the header for that row. Similar thing for F1 slash F2. I just typed all that in. Oh, they didn't have to do any kind of word wrap or anything there. I do think that's probably turned on on those cells, but it's irrelevant. And I went back and made all the widths fairly similar and things like that. So this is, a, I think, a pretty um, neat and well-organized beginning to this spreadsheet. I wanted to show you how that was done. So the subscripts are done like that, no matter where you use them in the, in the spreadsheet. Actually, that's the, the general idea behind a lot of Microsoft Office, uh, how you'll get to that is some kind of a, a, a font setting. Um, and the symbol is, again, a feature that's across all the different uh, programs in, in uh, Office, so how to get to those uh, symbols. Okay, so uh, let me actually then, I'm going to delete that sheet because we don't need that. I was just using it to show you. Let's come back to actually what we want to do. So it's fairly straightforward at this point. You can see what we need to fill in the columns underneath the headers. So do we need to have a column of values here that will evaluate cosine of theta 2 divided by cosine of theta 1, where the theta 2 and the theta 1 values are from the first two columns here. So it's fairly simple. Now I will type equals COS. That is the actual shortcut for cosine. That's pretty common. That makes sense. Um, 
there will be other functions you use that, that you may not know the names of. You could search for that. Um, Excel, we'll, we'll get more into it in, in later classes about how to find information about where things are located and so forth. But in this case, it's, it's quite intuitive. And you actually see there's a little pop-up uh, help here that tells you that you're about to use this cosine function. It says in the little bubble, it returns a cosine and angle. So to do this, we're going to open parentheses, and then you can see the little feedback is it's looking for a number. So I can click on, we want theta 2, so I'll click on the cell that has theta 2 in it. Here's something that I wish it told you in the pop-up. It doesn't. You need to know this. Excel does not work in degrees. It works in natural numbers, which are radians. So if I were to take this right now and say cosine of B4, so 55 degrees and hit return, it would not be the correct answer. It will return the cosine of 55 radians. So I need to convert that degrees to radians. And it's a fairly simple thing. You need to multiply by pi divided by 180 because there are pi radians in 180 degrees. It's a regular unit conversion. So we'll put the asterisk for multiply. We need the value for pi. I'm not going to attempt to type that in. Most of these uh, computational programs have that built in, just like your calculator has a pi key, almost certainly. In Excel, you type the word pi, pi, and it tells you actually the value it returns, but that's not all. You need to use empty parentheses after it. So pi, pi with the open closed parentheses, nothing in it as an argument, will return the value for pi to 15 decimal places then divided by 180. I'll close the parentheses, so that will complete the, the numerator. I'll divide by, so slash cosine, I'm gonna repeat the same process now. Click on theta one times pi, divided by 180, hit enter, and I forgot to close the parentheses overall, but it's smart enough to do that. So I had forgotten to enter that last parenthesis in the uh, equation. It put it in there, fortunately. So a little happy coincidence there. So now, as always, you can double click and fill that down. Okay. And sometimes it wouldn't hurt to just check if you double click on the cell. It does show you, well, at least there's the, the warm, fuzzy feeling that it's highlighting the cells over there for theta 1 and theta 2. So probably getting the right reference. This one is fairly simple for F1 over F2. We simply take F1, the pointer to that, divided by F2, and we're done. By the way, it's worth noting, there are no units listed for F1 divided by F2 because it's dimensionless. If you divide Newtons by Newtons, you get no units. Cosine by definition, cosine of anything, but that's the idea of putting it in as a, an argument in radians. Radians is a dimensionless number, even though we tend to put RAD as a placeholder. Um, but certainly by the, time you, by the time you take the cosine of that, it is a dimensionless number. So all these numbers in these columns that, I'm, that I just highlighted are dimensionless. Here's the beauty uh, and the power of Excel. Notice I selected all these cells. I can actually right click and say copy. And it, and it sort of animates this dashed box around it. I'll come over to one of the other tables, right click and say paste. And it copies the formulas in there. Again, if you want to double click on one to see, whoops, let me not do that. Here, let's say, okay, you can see that it actually is behaving properly. So that's kind of neat. Let me do that again. And now instead of right clicking and, and saying copy and so forth, and there are shortcuts you can get up here on the menu bar, the best shortcut of all that I use constantly is Control C. So you can't see me do that, but I just cl held down Control, click the C key on the keyboard. That's copy. I'll set, and now notice this is a chunk of cells here, a rectangular shape. I'm just going to, you don't have to select the whole area. You're going to put it in. You can select just the top left corner. Control V, as in Victor, pastes that into it. So those keyboard shortcuts are ones that I use constantly. Other shortcuts are Control X for cut. Control Z is uh, undo. Control Y is redo, and there's a whole host of other ones. At least Control C for copy and Control V for paste. I would strongly encourage you to learn those and get used to using them. They will save you a huge amount of time. So one more time here, I'll hit Control C for copy, Control V for paste. And I always do like the test here. It does show me I've got the right relationship. So it, it moved with its relative referencing to do everything we want. 
So that's really it. That's a fairly simple analysis here. That's the, the formulas are not that bad. Key thing to remember is that again, these trig functions, you need to convert your angles to radians. The upshot of this whole thing was creating a, a graph of all of these uh, force ratios versus the cosines ratio. So to start this out, I'm gonna select from the first set of values for 240.2 grams, or more importantly, 0.42, 0.4, 2402, excuse me, kilograms. Um, I'll select those, go to insert, and then chart, and I'm gonna select scatter, and it creates my chart there. Let me uh, rearrange this just a little bit. I, I like a little bit of a, a more of a portrait mode for this. Um, I've done some of this before in uh, some of the other classes. Uh, some of these things we're gonna do are just kind of preferences. Some, uh, you can use your own sort of style, but I do expect you to do these sorts of things. And that is, for instance, making a better chart title, um, making uh, axes, labels, things like that. I'm gonna begin by getting rid of the grid lines. I really don't like them. So I'm just selecting them and hitting the delete key. By the way, other way you can do that, if you look at the right of the chart, there are these three buttons, these hot buttons. If you click the plus sign there, there are things you like I could have turned on or off the grid lines by uh, clicking on that. There are other things like legend, trim line, uh, excuse me, trend line, error bars, um, chart title. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and also click on axis titles. So if you just check that, it'll put them in both places, but it just does generic axis title. It doesn't know what that is. Uh, that's okay. The idea, though, is that you can double click in here now and say what you like. And in fact, you might have seen when I double clicked on that, it popped up a window on the side uh, related to formatting that particular axis title or whatever I'm clicking on. That changes as if I click on the plot area or the chart area and so forth. So that's a pretty intelligent uh, sub window that's there. I want this axis title to say what's in the cell here. Any one of these really doesn't matter, but what says the header of the cell. So we could do something, I, I don't believe there's a, a way to dynamic link, dynamically link that, but what we could do is I could come up and select out of the formula bar, that whole thing, control C, copy. And then if I come down to where it says axis title, I'll, I'll delete what's in there and then paste in my label. So that came out pretty well. Let me zoom in on this a bit. Uh, the only issue is it did not maintain the subscripts. Not, not a big deal, so we can come back in. I'll double click again. I'll highlight that. I'll go back to the home menu. I'll go to the font sub menu. I'll click subscript, and lo and behold, it will do that. Uh, it's tedious. I, I can't control that, unfortunately, but it's not too bad. So there's our label, cosine theta 2 over cosine theta 1. The axis title over here on the vertical axis, I mean, it's just as easy to type this out to begin with. So I'll do F1 slash F2. This is a little bit harder to work with because it, it now is oriented in a, in a different orientation from how your cursor sort of wants to work. So you have to select by dragging down the different subscripts here. So again, home, font, subscript, okay. And then for the two, home, font, subscript okay and there we have our labels actually i should probably say something maybe a little bit more in here maybe i'll make this say force ratio just to make that i think just just the simple symbols there that the label is a little small maybe gets lost here i don't know so i'll do that i'll zoom back out and here's our chart to this point okay um, I also think these personally are a little too small, so I'm going to select the, the horizontal axis. I'll come back up again to the home sub menu, again to the fonts, the, so the home menu, the, the font sub menu. I'm going to click on the large the A here with the arrow next to it, and that sequentially increases the size. So maybe I'll make that 12 so it matches the font I have in the rest of the spreadsheet. I'll do the same on the vertical axis. I'm also going to do that. I'm going to click on the numbers, so the actual axis itself, and make those bigger. I like them to be about uh, 12 point. And then same on the horizontal axis. Um, 
I can't help but point this out. I don't know. I It always looks to me like this vertical axis label is smaller, even though the font size is the same. I usually make that about one point bigger. So if you come up to the to the font sub menu here, select where it says 12 point and type in 13, hit enter, it'll actually make it slightly bigger. So it will do those intermediate sizes there. Okay, let's make our chart title something more meaningful. So maybe we'll say this, um, F, I'm gonna say sub X, uh, force balance comparison, or something more meaningful like that. And again, you could select the X, home, font, submenu, subscript, and there you go. Maybe move that over a little bit. You can move the location of these things too, if you like. Okay. So that's, by the way, only one set of data on here. Let me do one more thing. These axis numbers, the, the labels on the axis of the actual, for where the tick marks would be, so to speak, um, they're drawing their number number of decimal places from the data themselves. And since I had sent three decimal places, that's what they're showing. But I think it's a little ridiculous. I don't need to see the scale 1.000, 2.000, and so forth. We can change that. If you click on the, the, the horizontal axis, let's say, again, on the little pop-up menu on the right for formatting that, um, sub menu in there it looks like the little bar uh, charts here those are axis options and you'll notice you have bounds like min or max right now they're set on auto if you scroll down there way to the bottom is one that says number you have to click to expand it with its arrow and scroll down a little bit further we can change that let's say one decimal place on that you can hit enter and it will update and then i'll do the same on the vertical change that to be just one enter I think that looks a lot nicer. Here, I, I could probably get away with no decimal places on the horizontal axis. Uh, I would definitely want them on the vertical axis because it has divisions of 0.5, but I'm gonna leave it as is. I'm, I'm satisfied with that. So we've got something that looks pretty good so far. Let's add another data set to this. So I want, I want to show these values, the force ratio versus the um, cosines ratio for every one of these different masses. So in other words, let me select here. I'll just pick the next mass and the next uh, set of values for the next mass. I want to put these same data on that chart. To do that, I actually have to go back to the chart. I'm going to right click and say select data. And it comes up with another window here where eventually it will keep track of all of what are called different series. So Every chart here can have different collections of values that it shows. It refers to them as data series. In a more general sense, I, I uh, see other uh, programs and so forth refer to them as plots, but that's fine. It doesn't matter here. We'll just refer to them as series. You can hit add. And I know I have these uh, these data selected in the spreadsheet, but it's ignoring that right now. There are three things you can do. You can do the series name. I'm gonna show you that in a minute, why that's important. I'm gonna leave it blank for right now. Series X values and series Y values. So this is an interface that says, where do you wanna get these values from? If you click the little arrow here, you can select the range. So I'm gonna click this up arrow. This window shrinks a little bit. I come back and select, it's kind of unfortunate I already had those grade. Again, I wanna emphasize the fact that those are grade is irrelevant. Select the first column uh, of the values here, the, the cosines ratio, because that I want to be on the x-axis. I'll go back and then select the y values, which is the corresponding set. Go back, and you can see it already popped some stuff into that. I'll hit OK. And let me just hit OK here. So now it did. It was smart enough to color code them differently because they really are two different data sets. Okay. And because they come from different uh, parameters, somehow on my chart, I wanna be able to emphasize that. I don't wanna just, I mean, I, I could leave them colored like this and assume people understand that those are different, but it's not different uh, data series, different plots, but it's not really very helpful because I don't know what's different about them. So one thing we could do here, if I click again on the chart, I'm gonna go back up to that plus sign, the, the hot menu, the hot button. And I'm going to come down and select legend. And you'll notice it did create something here on the chart now that if I click on it is a box and you can move that box. 
it just calls them series one and series two. And the only reason it knows them that way is because the blue ones, that's the data I put on there first. So they're one and the second one of series two. Uh, I don't like the fact that when I did that, it kind of shrunk this so-called plot area. So if you click that, you can actually drag that back out. I like to do that because I want to take full advantage of the space I've got. I want to actually expand this out and make sure I can use all of the real estate sort of that's available. This actually, before I go any further, let me also make that bigger. Again, my 12 point. So that's not very helpful. It does at least identify that they're different series. It doesn't say what they are. But again, if we right click, go back to select data and I'll go to series one and hit edit. That's where that series name is important. So what is different about that? Well, what's different about all these I'm going to put on here is the mass that we used. So you can actually click this select range again and I'll scroll over a bit. You can click on a cell here and dynamically link that. I'll hit OK to your series name. Now, if I move this over, notice it put that in there. So that's kind of neat. But here's my problem with that. It just says this number 0 0.2402. It doesn't tell me what that is. Now I could go back and in that cell actually put, instead of where I have, let me hit OK. Instead of where I have on the left, I have in one cell mass kilogram equal and then the number in another cell, I could bury that all in one statement. Here's the drawback with that. If I do that, then I won't be able to use this number for the mass anywhere. On this particular sheet, that's not a big deal because I'm not using that number for any analysis. On the other analysis though, for the Y direction analysis, I'm going to need to use the value for the mass in the calculation so I cannot bury that in a cell with other text. So there's, if it, if it helps in one place, it's gonna hurt in another. So instead what I'm gonna do, let me come back here again, select data. I'm gonna select the first series set, edit. Let me delete what's there. Instead, I'm just gonna type that it is 0, 0 0.2402 space kilograms okay and you could add other things too you could say mass equals let I me mean, maybe i'll do that and you know what i'm i'm looking ahead here i'm going to do this several times so i'm going to select that and hit control c and copy it because i'm above all i'd like to minimize my work if i can so let me hit okay and now you can see how it i, I have some adjustment to do but that's a a, a much better looking legend Series two, I'll hit edit and I'll paste in what I had and change it to the 2302, remembering that that's what was uh, relevant or pertinent to the second set of data. I'll hit OK. Before I close this, let me finish all this off. I'm going to add. The next one will be, I'll paste in 0 0.2202 kilograms. I'll select my X values. Come back up, select my Y values, come back up, hit OK. You can see they populate in here with gray dots. Uh, it did create the extend the legend. I'll say add one more time. The last one is 22 or 2002, it's 202.2 .2 grams. X values from the last table on the bottom. Y values from the last count, oops. Last column. By the way, if you make a mistake here, you can just redo it and it will update. Okay. Okay. And okay. So there it is. Now this looks a little weird, but if I move this up here, I can reshape this, drag this out, drag this down or up rather, even a little bit more. Sometimes I, I do, in his case, I think I will make this 11 point because if I get kind of wordy with the legend and it doesn't fit, um, I may need to shrink it a bit. You can actually, if you select that legend, you could, let's see where the options are. If now, remember, I got the legend so, for, uh, selected here. So the little window, the sub window on the right is for format legend. There is legend options, which is the bar graph. There's also here in every one of these little sub windows for the most part, there's this little paint bucket that has to do with how it looks. So if you click on that, you could put a border around it if you want, say a solid line and you can change the color, I would say, maybe like a dark gray or something. And there's what that does. If you want to make that stand out a little better. I don't generally like the, the boxes like that, but I'll leave it there anyways for this discussion. It's up to you. That's, that's, that's totally your preference on that. So that's looking pretty good. That's more or less what we want. Um, 
while we're on this topic of formatting, let's say that I wanted to change some of these. It might be a good idea. Some of these, sometimes the yellow is hard to see. Um, and also these dots are a little small maybe. And maybe what I'd like to do is have to, to help increase the sort of the differentiation between them. Maybe I don't want them all to be circles. So let's say I select the blue circles. So I clicked on them and you'll see that it shows them selected in the chart or the plot area. And then on the right window, it has format data series. Let me click on the paint bucket again. That's how they look. Here it comes up with a line and it's selected no line. And that's because of that's how we had first chosen this chart. Leave it that way. Our general uh, concept here is we show experimental data. It's just the points, just the markers and no lines. And we show expected or theoretical or predicted curves with solid lines. So I'm going to leave that as no line. But if you click on the word marker, now you can choose how that looks. You can expand marker options. I'll select built in so it's not automatic. I'll leave this one as a circle, but I'm going to make it a little bigger. So maybe I'll make it six point. You can change the border if you want. So a solid line and maybe I'll make it green. And then the fill, I'll make it solid and maybe I'll make it a light green. I like to do that. I like to change my color so that um, it's, a, it's a lighter color inside and the same darker color on the outside. So that's kind of neat. It's a little bit easier to see. If we compete, uh, uh, continue this process, I'll select whatever one, next one you want. I'll do the orange circles. Um, again, I'll go to marker is selected here. I'll do built in. Maybe here I'll do the squares. They tend to look a little bigger already, so I think I'll leave that as a five. Uh, I'll do a solid fill. I'll pick um, maybe a light orange, and then I'll do a solid line that's a dark orange. Okay. Then I'll go to the, it gets a little harder sometimes to pick these. I'll do the gray circles next. Um, here I'll do built in, and maybe I'll uh, pick the triangle, make that six solid fill. I kind of like purple. I'd like to use that color. There's no light purple here. Well, actually there is as a recent color, but I'll show you how I did that. If you go to more colors, you could pick a purple, let's say, and you could change with the slider how dark that is. So I'll pick it there. Maybe I'll hit okay. And that stayed. And then I'll do a solid line for the border. That's a bright purple. Again, let me emphasize, you, you can do whatever you want on these, really. It's up to you. I'm just uh, trying to show you how you do it and that you should think carefully about uh, what increases the legibility, the readability, and the understanding of what's here. So I'll go again back up here to built in. What's left is the triangle. Maybe I'll make that a six point solid fill. What haven't I used? Blue, right? I did have blue before, but that's okay. Solid line, uh, dark blue, maybe there. And you know what? I think I will make the squares back to six point because now they are looking a little small. So there. What's also nice about it is if someone were to print this, let's say, and didn't have a color printer, they could still tell these markers apart versus if they were relying on color, they wouldn't be able to. So we're almost done. The only thing that's left is you might recall from the document that there was an expected curve in here. And the expected curve, as it said, is a, a, a line, a straight line that has an intercept of zero and a slope of one. So that's pretty easy to draw. I don't need to make up a bunch of points for that. Um, a straight line is very easy to do. You only need two points. So let me make over here to the side. It doesn't really matter where you do it. Let me say I will, and let me call it expected. So I'll leave a little bit of a header here and I'll make that bold. And what I want is I want to put underneath some numbers that will define that plot or really it's the data series to be precise. So I'm going to come back over. Let me copy these headings from before. So control C and then I'll come over and hit control V and it'll paste them in. Notice from before I had um, sort of a dark border a heavy border on top of them just to help kind of accentuate this. It turns out the borders that are on the headers here that I'm selecting, the light border, the, the, light, the smaller border underneath was applied to these cells that I'm selecting. So it was a, a border underneath. The heavy border was applied to these cells that I'm selecting. So if I want to have it over here, I'll have to select expected and the cell next to it. And then from the pull down back under this, believe it or not, it's actually under font, uh, I'll select thick bottom border. And there, I've got that set up. 
So this is fairly easy. The two points that define this are quite simple. It goes to the origin, which has 0, 0. And then I'm going to look at my graph here that I've got so far. I'd like my expected curve to sort of cover the real estate, so to speak, that's in here now. And you can see this must be pretty close already to the relationship I want because it, by auto scaling, it got an extent of 4 and 4 on the two axes. So let me pick those numbers as well, 4 and 4. And just to be consistent, I will center those. Let me add that. So I'll come back here and I'll say select data. I'm going to add. This one I'll call expected. Series X values come from here. Series Y values come from here. There's only two points. Okay, return, okay, okay. So it didn't look like it really did much, but you can see it did put the two little dots at the end. So here I'm gonna come in and select that and go to the paint bucket for the format data series. I'm gonna to go to line, I'm gonna say solid line, and maybe I'll make that black um maybe just a little bit thinner than that on the width everything else looks good for that let me go to marker and now when i expand marker options i want to turn that off i don't want to see the markers on that because that see the markers employ something specific or, or imply something specific about those points that line even though i drew it with two points it has infinite applicability right anywhere along there it follows that relationship so i don't want to just mark the points and imply anything you know special about that, so to speak. Maybe I'll move this. Might have to move that a bit. Um, when I put that 0.4, 4, comma 4, I'm going to put it on there. It actually rescaled everything. So now it made it the horizontal axis go to 5 and the vertical go to 4.5. That's a little wasteful. I don't really need to go. That's all wasted white space. So let me go back and select the horizontal axis again over to the format axis. I'm going to actually override the maximum bound and say 4, hit enter. I'm going to do the same on the vertical one, override and say 4, enter, so that I, I, I don't really need all this up here. I want to show it extending beyond and kind of try to indicate with it that it's, you know, it's an overall expected trend that extends to wherever I want. But I want the axes not to be any, any larger than necessary, any wider than necessary. So that's really it. There's our chart, all the elements on it. It's got labels on the axes. It's got a, a very nice legend. It's, it's uh, uniformly formatted, uh, fairly balanced font sizes, um, reasonable precision on the, the uh, numbers on the axes and so forth. So that would complete the, the creation of that chart. Let me now show you on the other worksheet, the data and Y analysis. You're going to do something very similar. There's a little bit more to do here, though. You'll notice some of the labels at the top. And I put some intermediate ones in here to make this a little easier to follow. So there's a sine theta 1, sine theta 2, then your sines ratio, these intermediate quantities, beta 1 and beta 2, and then the negative uh, force ratio, minus beta 1 over beta 2. And I did put in here an equation, a little box. You can remove this when you're doing this if you like, uh, just as a little refresher of what those terms, how they're defined. So they're defined in terms of the forces and the angles. And in this case, also the masses and G. So now here's where I was saying that we need to know the values for the masses in consistent units, which would be kilograms. And we also need to know G. So I did put that in the spreadsheet up here to get started at the very top left. You see there's our value for G in meters per second squared. We'll just take 9.8. Again, we've got all these kilograms, uh, the, the values shown here. So I'm not going to complete anything in this part, in this particular worksheet. That's for you to do as part of the studio. And you'll also create over here to the right. There's nothing there now, but you'll create another uh, chart just like we did. I do want to show you just a couple of things here. Notice there are no numbers, no measured values here. I just want to show you another feature of Excel that's kind of neat and how it can work between the workbooks. Let me close the, the sub window over there. I made a note in here. This is a text box with an arrow. Just to, to note, these angles are now in radians. And so I colored the headings red just to further emphasize that. We didn't have to do that, but I thought I would show you a way that you can actually um, put that in there to start with. So then when you go and evaluate the sine theta 1 and sine theta 2 and so forth, you don't need to do the conversion buried inside that. It really doesn't matter. It's not a big deal, um, but it's just an opportunity to show you something else. And how we can get those numbers from the other sheet here without copying them. We're actually going to make a reference into that. 
So what I'm going to do is, let me show you this first of all, just with the forces. If I want to get those numbers from the other sheet here, and let's say that I wanted my other uh, sheet, the data and X analysis, to be sort of the master one that contained all the values, and then I want to use that somewhere else. So rather than kind of copying and pasting, I can make a dynamic connection. So I could put in here equals for F1, and this is for the uh, 240.2 grams. I'll come back to the data and X analysis and click on the corresponding F1 from there and hit enter. And that put that value here. And if you click on it and you look at the formula at the top, you'll see it makes a reference to that sheet. There's in single quotes, the name of the worksheet, data and X analysis, an exclamation point, and then J4. So it's saying it's gonna to go to that worksheet and get the value from J4 and put it here, okay? That doesn't seem right. It isn't right. I clicked on the wrong one. Let me fix that. I cleverly showed you why you should pay attention to what you're doing, right? So equals, come back here. It should be the same C4, right? So there we go. I had drawn from the wrong table. Okay, so that comes from C4. Here's another beauty of this. I can just copy this over. So I use a fill handle over, and then I will drag it down. Let's say I forgot how far I had to go. I could just drag it and let it go. Those empty cells on the first sheet just come up as zero, so I know they shouldn't be there. I'll hit delete. So you could go back and verify. It wouldn't hurt to do so that those are indeed the same numbers, and they are. So kind of nice. Now, I want to do the same for the angles. However, I want to build in the conversion at the same time. So for the first theta one, I'm going to say that's equal to pi divided by 180 times the value, corresponding value from the first sheet, hit enter. And now it did that conversion as well as getting the value and bring it in here. So that's already converted to radians. Again, you can copy it over, you can drag it down. Oh, one more. And if you were to double click on any one of these, you can see it does, it still keeps it still goes to that same worksheet, but within the worksheet, it will move the reference as we would expect. So it so happens I can take all of these, control C, copy, control V, paste, and they will be doing the same thing. You can verify that they are the same numbers. They are indeed, although these wouldn't be the same. Obviously, the angles are not going to be the same because they're in radians, not degrees, but the forces are the same. Okay. Now you can do the same over here. Now I will warn you, don't copy and paste from here, let's say, to here. You will not get the right values. In fact, you can see that. Let me move this out of the way here. These forces are not supposed to be zero. The reason why that doesn't work is because there are intermediate columns in this spreadsheet that don't exist, in, in this worksheet that don't exist in the other worksheet, the data and X, X analysis worksheet. So it's doing the right relative referencing. It's just that this has moved it too far. So you don't want to do that. You do not want to do the copy paste. You're going to have to come in here and re-enter the formulas. You can at least copy down below, uh, but not just across. Okay, I think that does it. That's everything I wanted to show you. To recap here, when you're doing this, just remember the trig functions have to use radians, not degrees. I showed you how to get to the symbols, theta. I didn't show you beta here, but again, if you click on the symbols, I have beta from before, but you know how to find it. So it's done the same way. You can create your labels the same way uh, for, the, for the axis titles and so forth. So we'll see you in studio.